This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. Facebook undoubtedly has some of the top designers in the world working under one roof. But what does it take to be a designer there? I asked product designer Earl Carlson to find out. I think that you need a strong sense of self. You need to be able to have um, strength in your opinions and be willing to change them, of course. But because there's so many designers and there's so much going on, you really need to have a strong voice. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. Whether you want a full-time job or you're looking for something temporary or freelance, we've got you covered. This week, HCSC Blue Cross Blue Shield is looking for the following positions in Chicago. Technology Application Architect. Senior Program Manager. Assistant IT Product Manager. Business Analyst and Senior XP Programmer. We also have job listings from Indeed.com, so head to the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to apply and to search for any other listings. Don't forget to sign up for weekly job alerts when there are new positions added to the job board. You'll get an email so you can be the first to apply. Again, that's revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. Find your next job here. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, I want to talk again about our great new episode sponsor for these past two episodes, Studio. Studio wants to revolutionize the way people see headphones, which is not just as a tech device, but as an accessory for your life. You know, I've been using the region I talked about on the last episode. It's their premium on-ear model earphone. I've been using it for the past few weeks. I've used it while traveling nationally and internationally. I've used it while working here at home. I've used it while editing the show. It's been really great. Over 24 hours of active battery life, 20 days of standby life. I don't have to worry about charging this thing every single day, which is great. And they look great too. They look and feel great. The region is the perfect mix of elegant modern Scandinavian design and proper sound quality. You can get a pair of the Regent or any of Studio's headphones for just 15% off when you use the discount code PATH15 at checkout. And Studio offers free worldwide shipping. So check them out today at studiosweden.com. I'll make sure to put a link down in the show notes. Now let's talk about our other sponsors, MailChimp, Hover, and SiteGround. Automation is a really big thing right now. And the great thing about MailChimp is how they use automations to help make your email marketing efforts more powerful. You know, I read somewhere that more emails are being sent this time of year than any other time, which makes sense. I mean, of course, we've got, you know, Black Friday, we've got Cyber Monday. Now we've got something called Green Monday. This is new. I haven't heard of Green Monday, but apparently that's a thing now. Um, And automations can help you find a new audience with doing ads on Instagram or on Facebook, welcoming new subscribers, thanking first-time customers, and a whole lot more. Sign up at MailChimp.com today for a free account. MailChimp. Send better email. Your online identity really begins with your domain name. You know, no matter what kind of a designer or developer you might be, showcasing your passion online is super important. And Hover makes the process of finding a domain really easy. They've got hundreds of domain extensions. You can get personalized email, and they have award-winning customer service. Right now, you can get a .design domain for just $5.99 or a .tech domain for $7.99. Both of those prices are just for the first year. And you can go to hover.com forward slash revision path and get 10% off on your first purchase. SiteGround's hosting services are crafted for professional, business, or enterprise projects. They let you build better, faster, safer websites more easily, and they offer multiple options that your websites can grow into. All of SiteGround's plans have managed WordPress hosting, including staging and Git integration. And you can get started today by visiting siteground.com forward slash revision path so you can get 60% off on all their hosting plans. That's a really great deal. SiteGround, web hosting crafted with care. 
Now for this week's interview. I'm talking to author, educator, editor, and illustrator John Jennings. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Okay, my name is John Jennings. I'm a uh, professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California, Riverside. And I am a curator, graphic illustrator, graphic designer, design theorist, media professor. I do a lot of things, but um, mostly I'm a storyteller and designer. Yeah, and that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years or so. Wow. Let's start with UC Riverside. Tell me about some of the the current things that you're doing there. Well, I just started working here. I've actually, this is my fourth institution. It's a transitional space for me. For the last 19 years or so, I've been a traditional design instructor, so a professor of design, usually situated in an art and design context. But of late, I've found that a lot of my work has been more along the lines of media analysis. So I made the switch to doing media and cultural studies. So the program that I teach in is extremely interdisciplinary. So most of us are artists or documentarians or you know performance artists, what have you, that have a deep interest in various modes of research around visual culture and media studies. And so, for instance, our chair, Erica Suderberg, is a documentary filmmaker, right? But she teaches about the medium of film, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, so far, I'm teaching a course on comic books and U.S. identity politics, which I've designed, and also a a class on Afrofuturism and visual culture. Hopefully in the winter, I plan to teach a course to build off of the Afrofuturism courses. One is going to be Afrofuturism and the visual culture of comics, because I study comics as a medium, and also Afrofuturism and the visual cultures of horror, because I see that as an extension of social justice and horror and black bodies and how it connects to Afrofuturism. I know that that when Get Out released earlier this year, there's been, I think, a resurgence in people talking about kind of black folks and and the horror genre. Is that something that you kind of always had an interest in? Oh, yeah. Yeah. From the beginning, it's funny when when Get Out came out, I was like, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I'm I kind of like think of myself as an armchair theorist around this kind of stuff. So me and my friend Stanford Carpenter came up with this this notion of the ethnogothic, which is kind of, a, we looked at it as an extension of Afrofuturist ideologies that basically we're looking at like horror and supernatural stories or like stories that relates, relates to the black body as a gothic space that actually explores social justice or restorative justice politics, but with from the space of a horrific space, you know, from, from a space of a horrific experience, you know, which can be mapped easily onto our experiences in this country. So, you know, when I saw Mm -hmm. something like Get Out, it made sense to me. But I've also, but there's been other works, of course, like Beloved, obviously, is Beloved is a horror story. You know, people want to call it whatever you want to, but it's a ghost story. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. if you look at people's work like Sankofa, for instance, which is a possession narrative, it's kind of a time travel story, but it's also a possession story. You know, so we've been dealing with these types of supernatural spaces and social justice for a long time. So yeah, it's something that I was very interested in from a very young age, I think even, you know? So yeah. I wish you could tell my AP English teacher from 11th grade that Beloved is a ghost story. Cause I remember writing about that and, <laughs> and got a C on that paper. That's Cause she wild. said, what? she's like, it's she's like, Beloved is not a ghost. We're a ghost. Yes. It's a love story. I'm oh, like, so no, it's not. It's I was terrifying. like, it's very phantasmagoric. If you think about it. Phantasmagoric. That's one of my favorite words, but yeah, no, it is. <laughs> it is. I mean, like, no, it's about trauma. It's about like generational trauma manifesting itself in the shape of an apparition. Are you like, what? <laughs> anyway, it's true. Yeah. She was saying something about, it's more of, of about the, the love between a mother and a daughter. And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, but <laughs> not really. Cause the daughter is dead. And anyway, well, it's a um, <laughs> you know what? let me, let me find, let's find her and have a long conversation with that woman because <laughs> you're right. Now for people that are listening that might not know specifically what Afrofuturism is, can you just kind of give a brief description from your uh, standpoint? Okay. Um, well, Afrofuturism kind of like, first of all, very simple, description is speculative writing, right? Or, or speculative cultural creation that could be poetry, music, what have you, visual, visual culture that deals with like black concerns. So it's like Afrocentric speculative fiction, essentially. So speculative fiction that entails horror, fantasy, science fiction, magical realism, that kind of things. The original 
definition was more concerned with like cybernetic technology and things of that nature. It was uh, mm-hmm. visited by this this gentleman named Mark Derry in 1993, and I think it was his way of of dealing with like this kind of upswing in cultural production from Black people dealing with the speculative, right? And I think since then it's grown into these other tributaries, so to speak. You know, how it actually reacts to social justice politics. How does it actually encode itself in film and music, you know. Yeah, it's a really interesting kind of movement. Quite recently, there's been this upswing of what I call the uh, the Black Speculative Arts Movement, which I think, mm-hmm. is, you know, me and my friend Ronaldo Anderson and, and our uh, colleague, uh, Maya Crown-Williams, kind of like started pushing this notion of this is kind of our generation's Black Arts Movement to a certain degree, you know, because when you look at like, say, the Black Lives Matter movement and other anti-establishment concerns from from a, from a Black perspective, you can Mm -hmm. see like it merging with this speculative culture. You know, a classic example right now would be Octavius Brood, for instance, a book by Adrian Marie Brown and Walida Amarisha, which is a collection of science fiction stories written by people who are on the ground organizers. So Mm. the, the conflation of people who are thinking about speculative fiction and people who are thinking about black freedom in the, or the idea of black bodies in the future is, I think, a black speculative arts movement mentality. There's a manifesto and everything. You can go look it up. You know, so it's uh, I think it's this cycle of the art that is being informed by the social movement. It's, it's I'm glad that you pointed that out, because it certainly does seem like there's been an, an uptick in the amount of kind of black fantasy slash Afrofuturism things mm-hmm. that you've seen as we've seen more issues about social justice concern and black people kind of rise within, you know, the news and et cetera. It feels like there's been a, definitely a, there's a correlation there. Mm-hmm. No, I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think there are different factors in my Afrofuturism course I've been teaching. One of the things we'll be kind of like examining is what are some of the touch points that are aesthetically informing the movement? How have, have like our ancestral forebears, like, you know, Zora Neale Hurston and County Cullen and, George Shiler and Amiri Baraka, how have they informed what's happening now, you know, that kind of thing. And then also, what are, like, why is this happening now? You know, that kind of thing. And so we've been kind of, you know, having discussions about that. So we're coming up with stuff like, for instance, something that we never thought possible in our lifetime happened, which was having a black president, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. one thing, it's a huge, because now you have like before Obama, after Obama, right? For good or ill, oh, yeah. good or ill, you know. That was a momentous occurrence in our country, you know, and so there are people, kids who were born during his administration who never have never known anything else but a black president. And that's unprecedented, you know, and the only time before that that you saw a black president was in fiction, (laughs) you know, like, you know, like 24 or like Morgan Freeman or even Tiny Lister in The Fifth Element. You know, he's president of the universe or some craziness like Mm -hmm. that. So that's something that's interesting. The other thing is. The connectivity through the World Wide Web is unprecedented. And so these groups of interest started popping up, popping up in pockets. Like people who have been black geeks forever now mm-hmm. have a connection system that they can actually rely on to solidify their fandom and their politics. The other thing is access to the technology to create new work. So the tools of creation are now ubiquitous. Like, for instance, you can download an app to draw a comic book with or you can you can see, see stuff online to actually teach you how to use Photoshop properly. That kind of stuff is now prevalent. So the, the means of production of cultural work is actually a lot more accessible. So there's been different things that we've been talking about in the class. But yeah, but it's all about like having access to the information and then being able to dis- disseminate it at your own whim. Like you don't, have, you don't need a publisher to put out a book. That's the other comic. I was trying to think of who the other comic person was I had. On the show, and it was recent. It was a uh, C. Spike Trotman. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Of course, yes. I'm, yeah, I just saw saw her in New York Comic Con. She's brilliant. You know, I think she's brilliant, and like she's doing uh, work out of Chicago. She has her own comic company, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Iron Circus Comics. And I know that we talked about how being able to fund everything through Kickstarter and how the technology has kind of helped her really not only grow what she's doing, but also help to put other people on That's to right. tell other stories. Is great. You know, the the good thing about the technology is aside from kind of taking away those gatekeepers for access is that it also builds this awareness. I think we've certainly seen this, uh, this huge swell in I'm loath to call it blurred culture, yeah. but it's kind of like that whole, like 
comic book movies, TV, et cetera, which has sort of also just kind of grown in the past 20 years. But we've certainly seen a lot more from black people kind of stepping up and saying like, yes, I'm part of this. I've always loved this. Uh-huh. And this is what my contribution is to kind of the whole culture as it, as it relates to that. Yeah. Some people put, well, first thing I want to say, like Spike is, I think one of probably one of the most important comic book artists working today because of her contributions to independent publishing, but, and also just empowering to women of color. We have like two spreads totally dedicated to her work in the next uh, Black Comics Returns book. You know, I'm very excited nice. about that because yeah, we love Spike. Spike is awesome. Other thing is, you know, yeah, there's, there's definitely some pushback from folk about Blurred. Some people think it was a very toxic space. I embrace whatever it is. I mean, it's like anything that's like off kilter or it's now cool to be into weird stuff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> a lot of times yeah. if you're like the, the black kid who listens to like, you know, Guns and Roses and is really into heavy metal magazine and you're drawing weird like monster stuff, then you're like ostracized. It's not being not only not being black, but also not being, you know, masculine or whatever gender that you're presenting yourself as. What you're into also starts to push back against how people see you and stuff like that. So it's it's a really weird space, you know. And so to a certain degree, I think people get upset about it because the nerd culture does have kind of a there are some really like anti people of color or anti women kind of tones in that culture. And you can see it popping up now. I mean, fairly recently, there was a, you know, at the New York Comic Con, there was this retailer meeting where, you know, some of the retail, the comics retailers was like, you know what, you know, the blacks, the homos and the women are, are ruining our, our thing here, you know, which is totally not true. You know what it is? Wow. Yeah, seriously, it was really bad. <laughs> and then today, actually, I found out that Chuck Dixon, who was like, beloved comics writer, you know, is like a straight up, like super conservative dude. And he's writing this alt right superhero thing. And he got, wow. and they kickstarted it or they funded it through a crowdsourcing engine, raised like $120,000 for this thing. So $120,000. <laughs> so the culture wars are on. I think, I think, uh, and this is something just really interesting. Uh, the gentleman who puts together Blurred Con actually in DC said this, and I thought it was very, I'm going to get his name because I have his card. He said that um, pop culture is our last religion. And I was like, I, th- I thought that was extremely interesting, hmm. very powerful statement because. It's the thing that actually bonds us together more than anything, actually, is the culture that we've been creating through mediation. That's why it's like storytelling is so important. When you're creating like a brand or like a or like a logo or anything like that, you're creating an index for a story. And I think um, we're made out of stories and we keep editing those stories until they become what we think we need to be. His name is Hilton George. Mm-hmm. He's the founder of uh, BlurCon. And that's what he said. That pop culture is our last religion. And I don't know if that if that's his his phrase, but we're going to attribute it to him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. Anyway. And I mean, I think it's also important to note that a lot of this, uh, I guess, swell with Afrofuturism is also coming from the fact that in traditional science fiction, people of color, specifically black people, were not really depicted at all. So yeah. it's kind of this thing where it's like, are we in the future? No, that's what um, I'm saying. Ev- yeah. <laughs> that's really, pop- that's really problematic. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can you can see something like old episodes of Star Trek or or read old books and things like that. And we're not there. You've got green men and all kinds of other space aliens and things like that. But black people, mm, not so much. Oh, people, so yeah, people of color in general, you know, I mean, yeah. Like, yeah, but Asian people, people from Latin descent, Hispanic descent. That's what sociologists call symbolic annihilation. You know? And I, I know, you know, one of the things about, you know, with Revision Path, just kind of, I guess, circle it back to design a little bit is when I started doing this this show, I did get a lot of pushback from people, usually, I mean, within the design community, both black and white, about, well, why would you do a show like this that is only, you know, talking to black designers? And it's like, well, if you look at what's represented in design media we're not there. Right. We're, they're not showing us writing books or speaking at conferences or on other podcasts or videos or things like that. So let me make this platform so we can show that, yes, we're here. And these are the things that we're doing. It's kind of like you, you can't be what you don't see. That's right. And so being able to kind of create that platform to show that these people are out here and that we're actually contributing to the culture in very meaningful ways, whether it's just you know, being a worker at a company or if you're an entrepreneur or if you're on the speaker circuit or you're doing more than that. It's just important to show that we're a part of this, too. That's right. 
I mean, that's something I've been really interested. I mean, all my career as a designer, I was trying to interject various ways of looking at culture. Like, as far as I could tell, I, I created the first like hip hop design class. You know, if you look at the book Design Studies, it's been it was put together by um, Audrey Bennett. Oh yeah, she was at. Uh, oh, it's so funny you mentioned that. Mm-hmm. She was at Black in Design. I was. I told you I was there last week. She's actually going to be on the show coming up. Have you? Is that your first time meeting Audrey? It's my first time meeting her in person. We were supposed to record before I left and like the timing and the scheduling was off. Mm-hmm. But then like I didn't know she was going to be at Black and Design. So I show up on Friday and go to the reception and I'm like walking towards the reception and like pass her and her husband in the hall. Like mm-hmm. she's like, Maurice. And I'm like, do no, I know? Because no, no, no. I only remember her from her picture right. and see her in person. But she knew who I was. I was like, oh, yeah, I totally want to come on the show. And I forgot. And. So she's going to be on the show in, in the near future. Oh, but that's, yeah. that's good. Her and Ron are awesome. And I'm, I can't believe I spaced on her name. But basically, she gave me my first shot at creating a dialogue about hip hop studies and design. So I wrote a piece called Design Class, spelt like K-L-A-S-S, of course. <laughs> and I mm-hmm. kind of posited what a traditional modernist design studio could be fused with a hip hop aesthetic. And so from then on, I started teaching the special topics course, you know, that was around shifting what type of cultural products were being created through design aesthetics. And, it, and there was a lot of pushback. I was, at the time, I was at University of Illinois, and there was a lot of pushback at first about this because, you know, modernism is about, like, clean lines and, you know, it's coming from this kind of Eurocentric space and it's very German and, you know, I mean, it's traditional. Right. You know? mm-hmm. But I'm like, well, why is that valid and why is not hip-hop culture valid? You know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So it's something that I've always been wrestling with. And so it's led me to think about just how these particular narratives get projected upon us. And so I have to commend her for, she saw me speak at a AIGA in Chicago. It was an international, it was a national convention. And um, mm-hmm. she approached me about submitting something for her, for this book. And you no, know, it changed the way I looked at my teaching and it, it really like made me solidify my ideas around these things. And so that particular path led me to become like a hip hop scholar, but also thinking about hip hop and aesthetics and like black culture and aesthetics and design aesthetics from an Afrocentric standpoint. And that's kind of like how I ended up where I am, just thinking about myself as an interdisciplinary scholar. But essentially, I'm always a designer, you know, and a storyteller. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but it's it started in that space. So as far as I could tell, I think that I was probably the first person teaching a course like that. So No, that's amazing. That's a small world out there. Yeah, I had is. no idea. Yeah. Definitely <laughs> is. Did you bump it into Keita Thomas? Briefly, we didn't get a chance to speak for too long, but she is funny because I, I bumped into her, but she just came on to AIGA's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, like yeah. right as I was rolling off. Mm-hmm. So we didn't, we never really, I think, got a chance to speak at length, but she's someone else I want to have on the show in the future too. She's one of my favorite people. She was, she's my student as well. We, I taught her at University of Illinois and then also she got an MFA with me at Buffalo. So, and now she's teaching back at U of I where, you know, like I said, I, I, went and taught there. So mm-hmm. yeah, she's, uh, you should definitely speak to her about her ideas around design. So you get a chance anyway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's funny you mentioned that about hip hop design. Cause I'm, it's reminding me of this essay that was done by uh, Sylvia Harris. That was in this mm-hmm. anthology called the, the, I think it's the education of a graphic designer by Stephen Heller. Mm-hmm. I could be getting the name wrong, but it's by Stephen Heller. Yeah. And she writes in there about kind of the search for, like a black design aesthetic mm-hmm. and how with black design students, sometimes they come from this culture of imitation rather than innovation, because what's taught is kind of what you said, the kind of Eurocentric standards of design, mm-hmm. but then black students aren't really given the space to kind of create what their own aesthetic might be, That's right. which I, I feel like kind of ties into a little bit what you're talking about yeah, it's an oppre- with hip hop, because hip hop's a creation, you know, by black and brown people. That's right. Yeah. And a little bit of Jewish folk there, too. So <laughs> yep. it sprinkles. But yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like when I was in graduate school, I learned typography by mimicking what they said was good type. You know what I'm saying? And so and of course, there's issues around legibility, around placement that are very smart. But <laughs> then once you learn the basics, what starts to happen? You know, how do you explore different types of cultural attitudes? What are those? those connotations of those cultural attitudes, you know, when you're exploring yourself or other ways that people from various cultures make design. Mm -hmm. That's why like Ron Eglash's work and Audrey Bennett's work is so important because they're bringing in culturally centered 
design tools to talk about, well, you know what? <laughs> we already have a, our own system of language. We have our own system of order. We have our own system of like aligning things according to either something that's intuitive or something that's actually even mathematical. If you look at like uh, Ron's work and, you know, African fractals. So it's like, mm -hmm. these are touch points for us to look at various ways of pushing back against this kind of oppressive aesthetic, you know, where people just think, well, that's the way it is. It's like, no, no, it's just the way you see things. You know, it's not the right. way it is actually. And that's the kind of battle that I've been entrenched in for, like I said, a long time, even to the point where I figure like I could actually change the space a little bit more from other areas, you know? So that's why I kind of shifted from doing, from doing, from practicing this. Well, I do, well, I do still do like a lot of design work, but, uh, in the, the academy though, my role is more so as a facilitator and, and as a, uh, someone who analyzes culture now. And I, and I think that was a, a good move for me, you know? And also, you know, because of the work that you're doing in and around comics, I feel like you've got more permission to experiment yep. than you would in maybe, you know, a more traditional design role. I totally agree, actually. There is uh, a lot more fluidity in what I'm doing than what is allowed. People think that the arts are very liberal, <laughs> but it's like mm -hmm. not, sometimes not the case. Sometimes uh, the, the arts are spaces that are very strict about practice. They're very strict about traditions. And those traditions are connected to a particular type of, you know, perspective. And that's what started me to think about how do we analyze those perspectives from different standpoints, you know, how we use design to do so, you know. Now, when we spoke kind of before we started recording, you mentioned that, you know, that design and art are kind of these, uh, these things that are connected to overarching patterns that we see, you know, throughout culture and through race and things. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, so essentially, if you want to see the indexes or the effects of a particular type of system, you look at the art, you look at the graphics, you look at the things that are seen or not seen, you know, because I always say this, that what's not shown is just as important as what is shown. And so I mentioned earlier about this notion of symbolic annihilation. I mean, that basically is the erasure of a particular type of cultural expression that is connected to a certain set of individuals. When, when they don't see themselves reflected in the culture that they participate in, it's a type of death. It's actually it's a type of destruction. You know. So what I've been dedicating myself to is trying to either create new paths to, to see other ways of, of making or to unerase or to archive black expressions and design, art, comics, what have you, right? So it's kind of like what, and so the key for me was, uh, are you familiar with speculative design? No, can you talk about kind of what that is? Yeah, so speculative design is a term that kind of is generated, uh, again, out of the, out of the like, some of a European tradition, but it's basically utilizing various types of speculative narratives like science fiction and fantasy to make uh, what they call diegetic prototypes, artifacts, to actually try to figure out kind of social issues, you know, and the most seminal work on it so far is by Dunn and Raby. It's a book called Speculative Everything. But again, you know, a lot of these narratives are from black spaces are being not being focused on. So for instance, if you look at like one of the forefathers of critical race studies, Derek Bell, right, who was famous Harvard law professor, he would write science fiction stories as ways to talk about problems in the law around race. Most, you know, his most important, like, similar work is called Space Traders, right? And it's a science fiction story that involves these aliens that come down to fix, they, they offer to fix all of America's problems if America gives them all their black people. And so, mm. yeah, and so it's, it, it raises a very interesting legal issue, right, around race and, and how these amendments work. So speculative, speculative design to me was the key to think about race as a speculative space, like race actually as a diegetic prototype or a type of technology that has affected our entire society, that infects and affects our entire society. And then how many, how many of these spaces are essentially racialized to the point where it's normalized and we don't see it? You know, a lot of times people don't see the system that they're in. Just like fish don't understand that they're in water until they're out of it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. wait a minute, I'm, I'm dying here. Why am I? Oh, you know, they don't, they don't know that they're in water, you know? So that's what prompted me to come up with this, this kind of experimental space called critical race design studies. And the definition of that is an interdisciplinary design practice that intersects critical race theory, speculative design, design history, and critical making to analyze and critique the effects of visual communication, graphic objects, and their associated systemic mediations on racial identity. So that would actually look at stuff like 
from the design of slave ships to Jim Crow signage to all these different ways that, uh, you know, a racist system imposes itself on us through design. So, what, and, I, and again, this kind of could probably make a lot of designers uncomfortable because what I'm saying is that design is a racist system, right? And it, it has mm-hmm. to be. If, if America is based off of a racialized space, then, of course, all the propaganda that's emanating from it is also racist, right? A lot of it is, right? That includes typography. That includes all these different things. And also the lack of access to those spaces by people of color is also part of the discriminatory practices, right? Going to design school is extremely expensive, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> and very prohibitive to people, usually you know, to people of color who don't have the means to go to design school, you know what I'm saying? So that's part of it as well. So I'm looking at like the ephemera and indexes that are that are connected to racism and also different types of discrimination, but also the system itself as an invisible series of decision making processes that actually separate people. But then also how people of color sort of utilize some of those similar tactics to push back against those design systems. And a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm looking, I'm expanding the notion of what design is to say fine art. So, for instance, mm-hmm. I'm looking at people like Hank Willis Thomas and Lorna Simpson mm-hmm. and Carrie Mae Weems and Glenn Ligon, who are utilizing text and image in a way that a designer would. So, yeah, yeah. so I'm actually expanding how I'm looking at who's doing this type of work. And there are other people like myself, like Peter Fine, for instance, this wonderful scholar who's working on a book around the race and design right now, too. So, yeah. But anyway, so I think it's a really rich area of study. And. It could be, and the thing I'm trying to work out, I think it actually might be a nice underpinning to hang our hat, so to speak, on this this conversation around identity politics and, and design. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about some of your work. I don't, I mean, we're going to go back to talking about this because I feel like this is a topic that I feel like I've approached this on several different episodes. So certainly it's something that is is important to kind of the longevity of the space. But mm-hmm. let's talk about some of your, your work that you're most well known for. You are writing, you're illustrating, you're editing, you're doing a bunch of stuff. Talk to me about some of the current projects that you're working on. Let's see. I think I'm most known currently for the adaptation of Octavia Butler's Kindred with Damian Duffy into a graphic novel. Should I explain what Octavia Butler was or how does it? <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to. Yeah, go right ahead. I mean, basically, she's she's like one of the most important speculative fiction writers to, or just writers to live. She, at the time, was the only, probably the only black woman writing science fiction and fantasy on the level of, say, like a Arthur C. Clarke or, you know, Philip K. Dick. People like that, you know, as like huge science fiction mm-hmm. writers. She was, they call it the grand dame of science fiction. And to a certain degree, has been relatively unsung by like, quote unquote, mainstream culture. I mean, there's so many like films and cartoons about like, say, you know, the time machine by H.G. Wells, but like mm-hmm. hundreds even. Like there's so many references to this man who worked in the 1800s, you know. You know, very little work out about her in other types of mediation. So this is the first time that her work has been adapted into other things. It was important. It was put out by Abrams Comic Arts, came out in January, and debuted at number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. And uh, Nice. Yeah, we're very proud about it. And it's been critically acclaimed and hopefully going to get a chance to do more. And so that's, we're kind of working that out. But it's, it's uh, been quite wonderful. Let's see, curatorially, I worked on a project with Ronaldo Anderson a couple of years ago called Unveiling Visions, which was looking at like Afrofuturism and kind of like visual, like ephemeral, like visual culture spaces. You know, a lot of times people look at Afrofuturism from this kind of like overly academic side. And they kind of discount the fact that the stuff that's actually coming out in like the fine art museums and being and, and being talked about starts with pop culture. It starts with Uhuru. It starts with like people loving Ben Sisko from Star Trek. It starts out with like George Clinton, you know, that kind of thing. And so we yeah. wanted to bring it back to a grassroots space. Like, okay, well, you can pretend like this isn't like geek culture and underground cultural production, but it is, you know. So to me, like real Afrofuturism is coming from the people and not from these kind of academic spaces. So. You know, it can be pontificated about and be try to we could try to come up with like, you know, theories about it. But at the end of the day, it's about people loving seeing themselves reflected in in this culture. And I think that that's what our space wanted to celebrate: illustration work, all the things that people say fine art isn't. So the designed object is something that we focused on a lot. Um, the other thing that I've been kind of working on recently is a follow up to with Damian Duffy again to um, the Black Comics book that you mentioned earlier. It's a, yeah. it's a coffee table book that we got kickstarted. The publisher is now Lion Forge Magnetic Press Collection. 
it's due out in February. It's going to be a huge tome of like over 100 or so black independent comics art publishers. Again, kind of like just looking at the growth of interest in Afrofuturism, comic, black comic books and black comics culture. So that's I'm really proud of that. And with uh, Tony Medina and Stacey Robinson, just put out a book called uh, I Am Alfonso Jones, which to a certain degree is like a Black Lives Matter ghost story. It's about a young man who's like 15 years old, and he's black and Puerto Rican, and he gets killed accidentally by an off-duty cop. And the entire narrative is actually shown through the eyes of his ghost as almost like a Greek chorus. So, hmm. yeah, and it just came out. It's available now. And it's a graphic novel. It's Leon Lowe's second graphic novel. And uh, let's see, right now, you know, Blue Hand Mojo is a project that I did a while back with, um, with, with Bill uh, Campbell's company, Rosarian Publishing. And it's a... It's almost like it's, it's looking at the Great Migration, but it's looking at it through like a supernatural lens. So the main character is the fictitious cousin of Robert Johnson, the famous blues man who sold his soul, supposedly sold his soul to the devil in Mississippi mm-hmm. at the crossroads. So it, this is his cousin that I made up. <laughs> and so it's kind of like a black detective story mixed with like, say, a supernatural thing. So people have likened it to like Constantine or like the Dresden Files, but it's set in the 1930s and it's dealing with like black culture. And and he's basically trying to save his soul while he tries to help people along the way. You know, Kid Code is a project I did with Stacey Robinson and Damian Duffy, also in Rosario. It's kind of like a hip hop time travel comic. (laughs) And and then, of course, there's Box of Bones, which I'm working on with Ayuse Jemai Everett, who's a really talented science fiction writer. It's a 10 part like maxi series that I'm working on with Rosarium that basically is kind of like dealing with the idea of like unrequited rage around around black justice politics. So it's a horror story. It's almost like Afrocentric Hellraiser. Mm. Uh, that's what I would call it. So those, those are just a, a smattering of projects I'm working on. Now, are you doing kind of the same roles across all these projects? I'm actually not. Yeah, sometimes I'm a facilitator. Sometimes I am. A, uh, I mean, like, for instance, on the Alfonso Jones project, I was just a finisher. Like I came back. I did a little bit of project management and I did like the, the finishing tones of the project. But Stacey Robinson is the main artist. He's the main penciler. And I just uh, did ink, a little bit of inks and, you know, some of the tones on it. On the Black Comics Returns book, I work with a team of editors. You know, I have specific roles in pulling the book together. And uh, mostly it's chasing down artists to get like <laughs> to get form signed, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I get in where I fit in. You know, I'm a facilitator. So and I think it's just the design background helps a lot with that, like managing a lot of projects simultaneously, as you know, is part of what we do. And also basically doing what's best for the team. You know, so if you have to get at a project, you have to realize that like being a good leader is being a good uh, servant. You know, that's the thing is like you have to like any general should be able to like get on a, on the ground and fight with the soldiers if he needs to, you know, that kind of thing mm-hmm. she, or if she needs to, you know. So I think about the holistic team of how you put the stuff together. Like, for instance, Box of Bones is eight artists I had to work with because what happened was uh, I was working on the Kindred book and I realized, like, I couldn't do both of the projects simultaneously. So we shifted a few things around, made it into more of an anthology at first. And then we it actually opened up the collab. It's probably like the most collaborative project I worked on because I work with scholars and artists and inkers and colorists. And, it's, and I've been working on it for like the last three or four years, actually. So you work on a little bit at a time. How are you finding time to do all of this? And you're also teaching and, and, you know, putting together these courses and things. How are you finding time for all of this? I mean, you work on stuff a little bit at a time. And uh, <laughs> people always ask me, it's like, do you sleep? I was like, no, I actually sleep pretty well. And then when I need to take a break, you know, my wife makes me take a break. <laughs> and I go, <laughs> I go on a cruise somewhere or like we'll go to Las Vegas or, you know, something or New Orleans, you know, just hang out. So, yeah, that, that kind of stuff happens. I don't know. I just have a facility for collaboration and I'm very stubborn when it comes to projects. So like it might take me a while to get it out, but I'll get it done. And so you just have to, you know, manage your time. Oh, the other thing, too, is, is we don't have any kids. <laughs> so that's another thing. You know, I don't have any, uh-huh. I have any children. So like that actually frees up a lot of stuff. You know, if I had a kid or two, then it'd be a different. I think I probably have a more normal output. <laughs> so <laughs> but that has not been the case so far. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a lot of different things. I'm really passionate about the work. I realize, like, to me, it's all a design problem, too. So I think, like, my overarching design problem is to realign how people see the black subject. I think part of the problem is the black body has been projected upon in a very dangerous light. So, for instance, instead of a young man who's going to the store to get Skittles and some tea, you see a thug and you kill him. That's a misreading mm-hmm. of the black body as a type of text, right? 
So, and this is something I thought about with um, Mark Anthony Neal's book, uh, Looking for Leroy, where he's talking about legibility of different types of bodies. And so when I started thinking about it, I was like, well, hell, legibility, that's something that designers deal with. So, right. so my idea is like, how do you make people see the black body as being legible as a white body or different or as nuanced as a white body or any other type of body that is privileged in a particular way? Like, how do you do that? So you have to change the story, you know, because essentially stereotypes are just indexes for stories around black people. Like, for instance, the Jezebel story was created to leg- legitimize the raping of black women. That's why that story was created. Right. The black buck is a stereotype that was created to legitimize the murdering of black men because they're wanton savages, right? The Rasta's character was created as a stereotype, was designed as a stereotype to legitimize slavery. You know, that kind of, thing. oh, they're happy slaves. You know, so these, this is something to me that is a visual, to a large part is a visual communication problem, you know? So when I'm putting together like a, a con, like, like for instance, the one that we do in Harlem that brings in like seven, 8,000 people, I'm trying to realign the black subject. So, this is these are things seeds that are being planted that I won't live to see, you know, because there's mostly families and kids coming through there. So think about being an eight year old kid or a 10 year old kid walking into the Schomburg Center, which is the repository for the Harlem Renaissance. I mean, literally, some of the ashes of Langston Hughes are buried in the foundation of that place, like literally. Right. Mm-hmm. Walking into one of the blackest spaces on the planet on Harlem <laughs> in Harlem, that's like 125th and, and Lenox which is Malcolm X Boulevard, right? And you see nothing but yourself reflected back at you. That's what white people see every day. You know, Mm -hmm. that's very empowering. We don't get a chance to see that. So in that particular space for those two days, we are the default. Now think about like how powerful that is as a visual message to someone who is just forming their ideas of what self is and how, to me, that's a design problem. And people don't see it that way, but that's the way I look at it. It's actually, I'm trying to redesign how people see themselves in that space. So, yeah, even though it's comics, it's actually a design problem to me. And that's why this whole idea of like critical race design studies is so, ex- is so exciting to me because it's stepping outside of what design is actually purpose to do. Now, most people don't like to talk about it, but graphic design comes out of the advertising and marketing profession, right? When D.A.W. Dwiggins coins the term in 19, what, 22, I think, graphic designer, you know, is coined mm-hmm. by like Dwiggins back, and he was speaking of it in reference to commerce, right? So there's a commercial side of design that actually supports the entire industry, right? And whether we want to acknowledge that or not, that's totally fine. A lot of times, designers are taxed by advertisers to sell stuff to people that we don't necessarily need. When you're trying to use that that type of epistemology for something that's like around social justice or like social change, it's always a side discussion, right? It's always something that's not part of the main discussion, you know? Because at the end of the day, you got to eat, right? Yeah. So how do you actually like utilize that particular mindset in a traditional design school? Well, the answer is you can't. <laughs> I think you can't like deal with that. I mean, this, you're going to have a lot of like I can tell you from experience, it's going to be a very difficult road for you. So that's why I stepped outside of a design space. You know, it's like I can't. It's too limiting for me. Right. Mm. So, yeah, it's too much. And it's like because at the end of the day, you're going to have to leave with a portfolio. You got to get a gig. Right. And you're going to be working for large corporations that sometimes or most times are very unscrupulous on purpose. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So it's like a very, you know, because a corporation's main gig is to make money. So, you know, it's it's a very layered design problem is what, you know, what they call a wicked problem. Right. Richard Buchanan talks about wicked problems. One problem is connected to another cause. One is one big Jenga, (laughs) you know, but Mm -hmm. one 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 thing people have to remember. Remember, though, it's like modernism or like the idea of a modernist standpoint comes directly from the Middle Passage. So I'm sorry, but it's like a lot of the a lot of the industrial revolutionary aspects, you know, come from the fact that America had all this free labor for like hundreds of years. How do you reconcile that as a black designer? That's something I've been thinking about for almost 20 years. So, hmm. yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> when no, you, you you just dropped a lot right there. I'm I'm trying to process that now myself. <laughs> I just uh, got off on a rant. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's that is perfectly okay. Do you feel like with all of this stuff that you're doing, that you're creatively satisfied? Oh man, you know, I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm in a space where I have a lot of agency around what I teach. So yeah, I think creatively I'm good. I mean, I just my only concern is that you know I'm not going to be able to live to see everything that I want out there, but I've been trying to like balance out the social justice work, the teaching and uh, 
and the creation of things that are coming directly from my crazy head out into the world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, I, I, creatively, yeah, I am satisfied. I think I have the best job in the world. You know, I've been really fortunate that people like what I do for the most part and are willing to listen to me, <laughs> you know? So, uh, I don't know. I'm in a good space. We'll see how things go. I mean, I just started teaching here. I like the student body so far. I like my department a lot. You know, uh, it's very, mm-hmm. very talented scholars, very, very caring scholars that I teach with. I'm also connected to the, um, creative writing department too. I'm a cooperative faculty with creative writing the other okay. thing, too, is the school has a, like, we just uh, approved in my department a minor in science fiction studies. And also, this is where the Eden Archive is, which is, like, one of the biggest repositories of science fiction and uh, fantasy work. And it's a library here. So there's a focus on doing speculative work from a graduate standpoint. So, for instance, you could be an ethnic studies grad and then get a focus in science fiction studies. So I'm actually part of a, a cohort of faculty connected to what they call... Um, Speculative fictions and cultures of science. It's a it's a focus that is generated from the Eden Archive. So yeah, I think I'm going to work it out. <laughs> so I mean, it sounds like you're in just the right place where you need to be. You you earlier described this as a transitional space. Yeah. Well, no. It, well, what I meant by that is like I, I just it, it to me it is a very new space for me. Like there's a lot of okay. things that I, it's transitional in the fact that I just transitioned into it, I guess, is what I mean. <laughs> you know, because, I, you know, like I said, I've been teaching studio courses for most of my career, you know, for the last, uh, like, November, my birthday, I'll be 47. That'll be my 20th year teaching in the academy. So, oh, so congratulations. It, thanks. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so, flies, <laughs> and it flies by. So, but yeah, but these are the things I've been kind of pushing at for a while, you know, and in, and I think... Actually, honestly, at University of Buffalo, I, I found enough space to actually kind of work through some of these issues. I was still in a design program, but it's so heavily theoretical that I was actually able to stretch my wings a little bit. It's been really good. What keeps you motivated with all the work that you're doing? Like, do you have a, a dream project of sorts that you're kind of working towards or anything like that? I think the only thing that keeps me motivated is the fact that I don't want people to ever feel like they're less. than I hate that. I hate bullies. And I hate the feeling that that your life isn't worth anything, you know, and that your expressions and, and it isn't worth anything. The thing that motivates me is to see kids happy and to see, you know, everyone on the same level. I mean, I really that's that's the thing that keeps me motivated is that at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's about like it's about our country and our people being feeling satisfied with, with their lives. And design, I think, at its best can do that. At its worst, it can be oppressive. At its best, it can actually be liberating. So, you know, I guess that's like, yeah. I guess that's anything, though. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, I think that's what keeps me motivated is that I really want everyone to be successful. I truly want that. <laughs> you know, so it's like I don't, I don't really try to curry. I don't really like to battle with people or, or like, uh, and if it, if it becomes a conflict, I, I really don't curry that kind of company. I try to step aside and try to like maintain a very level head when it comes to talking about these issues. Mm-hmm. I don't like oppressive spaces, you know, and I, and, I, and I think that at the end of the day, education is supposed to be liberating and not oppressive. So a space like UCR seems to embrace that same thing. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. What about that, that dream project? I know you're, you're working on your own works with, uh, I don't know if I, you with, know, I don't know if I have a, have a dream project. I think, you know, all of them are dream projects, you know, if I can get ideas out, I mean, shoot. A dream project would be to to adapt Octavia Butler's book into a graphic novel. That's a dream project. You know, I mean, that's been accomplished. So it's like, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that there's a maybe it's a body of work or like a an ideology that I think is out there. I think that uh, each one of them has their own special place in my heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think I have a dream project. I think it's a, just a, a dream of a, of a unified space where people can actually feel free to create how they want to without these different limitations that you actually find in in, in scholarship and, and things of that nature too so i always say if you want to go to a segregated space go to a university <laughs> you know <laughs> because it's like all the dep- like even the, the nomenclature like this is a art department you know a uh, you know or like a, a program you know i'm like well i always just tell my students i teach in a design d program the other thing too is like division this is the so-and-so division you know, I'm like, wait, what? No, we're not dividing people. Why are we dividing people? Just the nomenclature of the school. Like, what track are you on? 
what's really funny to me is like interdisciplinary study, right? I'm like, well, isn't that how we're supposed to learn things? Like, like kind of organically, you know, or like we're interested in all kinds of stuff. It's not a new idea, you know, it's put forth as a new idea, but it's not. It's actually the way that we're supposed to learn stuff. So I always tell folk, and they, they look at me crazy, like someone on the planet just now discovered Miles Davis, like right this second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that's new to them. They're like, what? Their minds are being blown. They're sitting somewhere in like Finland, <laughs> you know, and they come across, you know, a Miles Davis cut. And they're like, what is this amazing thing that I've discovered? Right? Right. That's how we stump, that's how we learn things. You know, you don't learn. It's a very unnatural way to learn stuff is in a university space. So what I try to do is shake stuff up a little bit. I try to design things that are that puzzle you. And, you know, sometimes to my, to, you know, it's it's a uh, sometimes it's to my detriment. I'm sure the students thought I was nuts <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> you know, but you have to bring in an organic, like safe space for them to fail. I always pray for my students to fail safely. Because mm. you, if you're if you're ready, you learn from failures more so than anything. And do you think that you're kind of creating that space for them with uh, in the department that you're in now? Well, you know, it's too early to tell. I'm hoping yeah. that I'm in, that I'm in, that I'm engaging them in a way that they find empowering. You know, but it's a different it's a different it's a different thing. I think my role here is more as a uh, as as a touchstone for a certain type of information. Like I, my role as a design instructor was very different because I was just trying to like design or help to, to foster curiosity in my students, which were mostly white and Asian students, honestly, who really don't think about these, who probably don't even think about the notions of like discrimination and race and things of that nature. Not never had to, right? So already like you problematize the, you, you make a problem of the space that you're in. My body as a black man from Mississippi already disrupts the space, you know? Mm. Already like when you know, Bell Hook says, uh, black bodies disrupt space and she's absolutely right. So just being a black designer is almost oxymoronic to start with, right? <laughs> Seriously, like it's like you're a, a unicorn, <laughs> you know? So that's already one thing. I'm, I'm sure that when I was at U of I, like most of my students had never even intersected or, or been exposed to a black professor or a black teacher probably in their lives, <laughs> you know? So, so, so that is already, yeah, I mean, because it was a very, most of the students that go to University of Illinois are pretty well off. They're from like middle class, upper middle class families, probably live in the suburbs. You know, so Chicago is a very segregated city on purpose by federal government standards on purpose was segregated through redlining. So most of the black people live on the west side or south side. And when they said it's from Chicago, most of the white kids going to U of I are from the suburbs. You know, they're from the Chicago land area. Right. So you come down state to go to University of Illinois and you see like a black professor in your class. You're like, what? <laughs> Who is this dude? <laughs> and mm-hmm. then I'm making them read stuff on social justice and environmental studies and things that make them uncomfortable to think about. Like, OK, well, you're going to leave here with a portfolio. What are you going to do with that? You know, <laughs> how are you going to contribute to mankind by making this uh, this brand? And after then, I also talk about the, the nomenclature. Well, like, you know, slaves used to get branded. What do you think about that? You know, so, so it's like, yeah, it's like my ideologies in those spaces is always problematic. And that's fine with me. What do you want to accomplish in 2018? Huh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, I definitely want to finish up the, you know, the work I'm doing on Box of Bones. I'm hoping that we're starting on new graphic novel projects. I just have like a lot of literary projects I want to get off the ground, you know. Maybe, st- I don't know, I've, I've been thinking about opening a business here in Riverside. I don't know if that's the case or not. We'll see. Like just selling prints and artifacts that are made by my colleagues or something like that. I don't know. I think it's just to mo- keep moving forward to establish myself as a a force for change on the campus. You know, I'm just starting here. I'm, I'm learning. It's, it's exciting because it's a new institution. It's a new space. I'm teaching a quarter system, which is the first time I've ever taught in a quarter system. So it's really fast. You know, quarters mm-hmm. are 10 weeks. I'm like, what? That's really fast. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out like, okay, how do I condense the information I want to get across to my students that way? So, and to just keep moving forward. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm always, uh, I don't necessarily have like quote unquote goals that I want to accomplish, but I de- definitely things that I want to impart to my students and, and things that I want to get out creatively. So I guess the current projects I'm working on and then trying to figure out what those next projects might be. And also to help collaboratively push, you know, the people I'm mentoring, I mentor a lot of folk. I try to help be a touchstone or like a sounding board for them. So I don't know. Those are things I want to continue doing. Yeah. I saw when you looked at your Tumblr, there were so many people that had reached out to you and you were like, 
yeah, email me here or yeah, I've been just busy. Get in touch with me. And that's something that I don't really see from, I don't want to say like, well, yeah, it's true. I don't see that from a lot of designers. I don't see that kind of willingness to kind of help and reach out to the next generation of folks that want to come up in, in the industry. As part of what I think about, to me, that's how you redesign design is you you utilize the power whatever the hell that means to <laughs> to uh <laughs> you know, whatever that is you know to impart to like future generations how else do you make things better how do you make a system better as you as you increase the number of people who are in the system who have a particular mindset you know that's how i get yeah. started so my, one of the central ideas around critical race design studies is the idea that if a system can be designed it can be undesigned or altered we all mm-hmm. know this but here's the thing. You have to have the willingness to want to alter it. You see what I'm saying? So you have to <laughs> you actually have the mm-hmm. like for instance, I mean, people could you could totally end all of the systems of oppression just by, you know, realigning your, your thinking around what's really happening. You know, the the main issue with a racist system or a system of oppression is the fact that you are putting other things outside of the human condition at the forefront of your design your design stance, you know. If you're only trying to make money, well, everybody knows, like in a capitalist system, somebody has to suffer. Somebody has to be used in a particular way. You know, yeah. the idea is to make profit. Then you uh, then someone is going to have to be taken advantage of. That's basic. If you don't own the means of production and you're working for someone who does, then you're not getting as much money, which means that you don't you don't have the opportunity to uplift yourself. Because honestly, <laughs> we've already seen that if if a corporation or some larger structure can pay you nothing for your labor, they, they will, will do it. They will do it. Exactly. Yeah. They'll pay you as less as, as less money as possible. So to me, that is a broken system. That's a system that's asking for an apocalypse. So I think that's why a lot of my fiction is either like restorative justice work or like a uh, dystopian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause one of the per- projects I worked on at Harvard, cause you know, I was, I did a Harvard fellowship like before I started teaching here was this construction of a transmedia storytelling space that I call the cyber trap. And it's basically like, if you can imagine like a black Southern cyberpunk, like dystopian, dystopian aesthetic mixed with like cyberpunk. So it's like trap culture and, and cyberpunk, but from a black Southern perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it's t- and so that's what I was working on as a, as a, as a way to kind of like, not only like critique mainstream science fiction, but also to look at like the systems that create various modes of oppression, you know? And so that's why I'll start looking at speculative fiction, the idea of using as a, Bruce Sterling calls it diegetic pr- prototypes. That is like storytelling structures that could be used to stand in for problems. You know, so you work through uh, a social issue by playing it out as a scenario. You know, that kind of. Yeah. Anyway, so that's kind of like where my head is right now. I mean, I'm into a lot of things. I want to do a lot of stuff. To my chagrin and, and sadness, I won't get a chance to do everything I want to do. But I've been fortunate that I have done a lot of things that I really feel proud about and have started the wheels turning in a lot of really interesting directions. And I think that's what any designer would want to do. Right. I think. (laughs) Oh, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, it's, you certainly don't want to just, you know, slave away kind of doing the same thing day in, day out. You, you hope that what you're doing is going to be contributing in a more positive way to the culture, to society in general. Yeah. No, I think that's true. Well, John, just to kind of wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? You know, it's funny because, and you're gonna you're gonna scold me, but I do not have (laughs) do not have a dedicated website. (laughs) Okay. And one of the oh, my wife just looked at me over the couch. She was like, "Yeah, dude, yeah, I I need to probably get one these days." Because what's happened (laughs) is like, let me explain myself (laughs) because I need because it's weird. Like you're a designer, you don't have a you don't have a website. Since I've been working for so long, I, I don't. I don't have to go searching for work. I mean, people present me with projects, you know, and I've been really fortunate in that I've built a reputation to work on projects and stuff. And, I, and I'm always busy. So I, so I generate a lot of work and I have not had a chance to actually curate that work. <laughs> so because I think when you go to a website, you won't be overwhelmed by things. Right. So mm-hmm. you can find me at, at J.I. Jennings. J, that's J.I. Jennings at Twitter. That's a good place to get in touch with me. I do have a Tumblr website, a CJ Adventures. If you do, if you do a Google search for that, you can find like a lot of my work. I found like a Tumblr space actually works better for me because I can update it quickly, and you know, you can see my stuff. It's not curated; it's just like a bunch of my things. <laughs> but mm-hmm. uh, you know, those are the best ways. You know, if you want to contact me via email, it's John J at ucr.edu. That's John J at ucr.edu. That's my 
you know, my job address, you know, which is, mm-hmm. um, you know, where I'm working. So those are ways to get at me. Publishing wise, I mean, I do have an Amazon author page up so you can see the things that I have worked on before. You can contact me probably through publishers too, like Lee and Lowe is a publisher now. Abrams Comic Arts is the, put out the Kindred book. Uh, Rosarium Publishing puts out a bunch of stuff for me. Cedar Grove Press, I'm getting actually getting ready to put up some, some more things with Cedar Grove. If those are different ways that you can kind of, I mean, I'm easy to find despite me not having a dedicated site. So, Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, John Jennings, I mean, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and for really kind of sharing a lot of the work that you're currently doing, talking about these, uh, the, these kind of things about moving into race and culture through comics and through Afrofuturism. You're doing, I mean, so much work. I mean, you're editing, you're writing, you're teaching, you're speaking. I mean, you're somebody that I think is really at the forefront of helping advance the culture in such a, a meaningful and positive way. And I'm just glad that you were able to come on the show and, and talk about it. So thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Maurice, too. It's been a great honor. And I, I really commend you again on what you've been doing with your work here with the podcast. So I hope that uh, a lot of people hear this and it spreads. And, you know, seriously, I, I really I'm glad that you're out there doing this work. It's important. Thoughts of love are in and that's it for this week. Big thanks to John Jennings and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about John and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, MailChimp, Hover, and SiteGround. Facebook designers work on creative products that are used by over 2 billion people. Their goal is to make the world more open and connected, and they use design in a lot of different ways to make that happen, whether that's creating prototypes, building new tools, or helping shape experiences. Learn more about Facebook design at facebook.com forward slash design. Whether you need to sell your products, share some big news, or tell a story, MailChimp makes it easy to create campaigns that best suit your message. Automate your marketing efforts, put your data to work, and watch the results roll in. Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. Every great idea deserves a great domain name, and Hover takes all the hassle and confusion out of buying and managing your domains. They offer free private domain registration, you can get your choice from hundreds of domain extensions, and you can connect those domains to your WordPress site, your Behance profile, your Dribbble profile, your LinkedIn profile, any of your profiles you can connect them to. Ready to get started? Just go to hover.com forward slash revision path and get 10% off your first purchase. Since 2004, SiteGround has been empowering web professionals and beginners alike to build better, faster, safer websites easily without having to worry about hosting. Visit SiteGround.com forward slash revision path and get 60% off on all your hosting plans. SiteGround, web hosting crafted with care. And of course, we have to thank our special episode sponsor, Studio. They've sponsored these last two episodes of the year. You know, and I, I gushed about these headphones at the top of the show. Um, I talked about them in the last episode, too. They really are great headphones. You know, I have a big head <laughs> and I have big hair. And so finding headphones is always kind of a challenge to fit over all of that stuff and also sound good at the same time. And, you know, Studio's earphones put design first with these great comfy leather ear pads. It's got a nice thick comfortable headband nice metal detailing on the sides you know they're they're really great headphones you really should check them out get your own pair today at studiosweden.com and save 15 percent off with the discount code path 15 this episode was edited by rj basilio and produced by me maurice cherry our intro voiceover is by music man dre with intro and outro music by yellow speaker if you liked this episode please do me a huge favor First, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, and next, leave us a rating and a review. It only takes a minute or two. It really helps the show out by bumping us up in the rankings there for design podcasts, and I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. If you like the work that we're doing here with Revision Path, then please consider becoming a patron. You know, now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives in our field are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support our mission, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. For 
just $5 per month, you can get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Y'all, we did it. It is the end of 2017. Thank you so much for listening, for downloading, for supporting us through this crazy wild year that we've had. We will see you in 2018.